Hi everyone, welcome back to Science on Trial and Error. After a short vacation break, we are back with plenty of ideas how to make this podcast even better. We have new guests booked and a special episode coming with a focus on beginning your PhD studies at the times of pandemics. So follow us on social media to not miss anything and to share your thoughts. Science on Trial was created as a space for us scientists to share our stories. I'm always very touched by the honesty and vulnerability of my guests, and I am very grateful that the episodes resonate with you. Thank you for sharing the podcast with your friends and for making this community even bigger. And now in today's episode, I am joined by Rose Wall. Rose lives in Scotland. She did her undergrad studies at the University of St. Andrews in theoretical physics. Currently, she's a PhD student in astrophysics at the University of St. Andrews in the group of Professor Moira Jardine. She studies the formation of prominences in the magnetic fields of low mass stars. Sounds enigmatic? Slightly, but believe me, Rose explains her work so well that you'll become biggest fans of Stellar Clouds after this episode. I was right away so impressed with Rose's enthusiasm to science. We've actually met over Instagram, where Rose is known as Astrophysicist Rose, and she shares her life as a PhD student and a mom of a toddler. She also draws fantastic cartoons to explain astrophysics and is very involved in outreach activities. I'm very happy that I had a chance to get to know Rose better and to hear her story. She is wonderful and I'm sure you'll love her too. And also we talk about space, so I don't know about you, but I was very excited. All right, here we go. Episode 8. Please welcome Rose Wall. Hi, Rose. Thank you for accepting the invitation to be on the podcast. Um, I'm very excited that we will have a chance to talk about your work and your other activities. Thank you very much for having me. It's it's great to be here in the virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how are you? Uh, you're in Scotland currently, right? Yeah, I, I'm a PhD student in, in Scotland. So it's supposed to be summer, but it's pretty cool today <laughs> but it's been very hot the rest of the week so I can't complain I can't. we have 35 degrees celsius today here in Vienna it's crazy it's it's really oh. so hot I cannot I cannot even <laughs> I look at you in your sweater and I'm just like <laughs> it's so hot um, yeah, I know that you're a PhD student in astrophysics and I'm very excited because uh, we didn't have an astrophysicist here before. Uh, so how about we just start for now with talking a bit about your PhD work. Uh, I know that you work on stellar prominences, which is basically this clouds that form on the surface of uh, star's atmosphere is that right correct me if I'm wrong yes <laughs> you've done a lot of research there <laughs> I get yeah. very curious yeah so I'm in my fourth year now I guess of, of my PhD so typically you know like in Europe that would be my final year um but because of the pandemic and and things like that I, I've had a bit of an extension um and I, I had a kid during my PhD as well so that also has kind of extended the amount of time yeah. for my PhD. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a final year <laughs> PhD student, but kind of not. Um, and my research mostly focuses on mathematical models and simulating where these, um, these prominences, these stellar clouds that you were talking about um, would form around kind of small stars. Mm -hmm. So so I didn't do astronomy for my undergrad. And, and when I was an undergrad, I, I kind of thought like, oh, all stars are like pretty much the same, but like some are a bit bigger than others. Yep. <laughs> and I, yeah, because it, it kind of feels like it should be like that, right? And I kind of discovered that this is not actually the case, as I'm sure probably lots of people know, but I, I, I didn't. Yeah, I put the caveat in that um, the stars that I look at are, are quite small stars. So kind of like, you know, the sun is a relatively small star. Mm -hmm. These stars are 
I guess, similar to the sun, but they're a lot younger than the sun is. I look at kind of baby, baby small stars. <laughs> In the younger stars, are they actually occurring more frequently, these prominences? Is that the reason why you're looking at, at them? Yeah, they're quite different um, on young stars. And it's to do with the fact that young stars, they rotate a lot quicker than the sun. Mm -hmm. And this kind of makes them a lot, a lot more active. So they have a lot more kind of strange behavior like these prominences. Um, on the sun, these clouds are quite, I guess, relatively small, probably not small from our perspective yeah. <laughs> as humans. <laughs> yeah, whereas on, on young suns, they can be like a hundred times the mass and and wow. uh, just much bigger in area as well. So they're kind of a different beast. <laughs> These clouds, they, they have gas inside, right? And this comes from the star mass, or am I understanding it wrong? Yeah, so it's, uh, they're mostly made of hydrogen, as mm -hmm. stars are mostly made of hydrogen. And uh, it all originally comes from the surface of the star. It's kind of, you know, like on Earth, the clouds that we have originally the water has come from the surface of the of the earth well i guess the oceans but it's yeah. still the surface in some <laughs> yeah. sense yeah yeah in this sense i did a bit of research it all sounds very interesting a little bit scary too i must say because from what i understood the stars kind of eject parts of their mass into these clouds and this can actually then also get out from the magnetic field of the star? Am I saying it right? Yeah. Yeah, and this, I think, can actually do some damage. So can you tell us a bit more about this? How dangerous this is? How, how dangerous are these clouds? <laughs> yeah. I mean, thankfully for us, you know, the, the sun has calmed down a bit and it's, I don't want to say old age, maybe middle-aged, <laughs> It's kind of it's kind of chilled out a bit. It's grown up. These clouds aren't too scary uh, on the sun, but yeah, because they're so much bigger on on young stars, and they're also much further above the surface, so it's a lot easier for them to be flung out. Um, so you don't really want to be on a planet that is orbiting around one of these stars because it's it's not unlikely that you might be. Um, hit by one of these clouds that has been ejected and released from the star. So that could do a lot of damage. Yeah, it could help to um, remove some of the atmosphere mm -hmm. of, the, of the planet if your planet has one, which you probably hope it does if, if you're on yeah, it. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, they can probably do damage, although the extent to which they do damage, we don't know because we don't know quite how frequent they are on these Uh, on these stars and things like that. So it's definitely still an area of research. Um, I wouldn't want to be on one of these planets, but it, it raises some interesting questions um, because the sun would have been like this when it was younger and yeah. the earth is okay. So it kind of makes you wonder how. <laughs> exactly. Is that, do you know whether the, our magnetic field plays a role or like? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if anyone completely knows the answer. I think definitely the fact that we have a magnetic field that's, it seems to be reasonably strong because it's, it's survived on Earth, um, has definitely helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's not only these, these stellar clouds that are a danger, there's a lot of other things that these stars can uh, throw out into space as well. So definitely our magnetic field is helpful. I, I feel like there's got to be more to it than that, but I don't, that's just like an in, intuitive feeling, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So these stars, as you said, they are younger than the sun. Does this also provide you with a way to look a bit into the past, how the sun could have behaved and also to study a bit more the evolution of, of, the, of the stars? As you said, they are like lower mass stars. Yeah, so I guess there's two two bits to that question, in a sense. So definitely when we want to know more about what the sun would have been like uh, in its past, we have to look at all the stars because any amount of study that we do of the sun is such a, a small time scale by comparison to its life. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the only way we can really get some answers <laughs> about about its past is to look at stars that are 
otherwise very similar, but a lot younger and, and kind of draw the analogy that the sun would have most likely been like this as well. And I guess in terms of evolution in general, you know, we, we talked about how these prominences can be ejected and that's taking away mass from the star. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and angular momentum. If, if your listeners are, are keen physicists, they've probably heard that scary term before. But basically, if they lose a lot of these clouds, it can make the star start to slow down. So it's not mm-hmm. rotating as, as quickly as it would have been. And we know that lots of other processes cause this as well. But I, I guess learning about how much the prominences contribute helps us understand a bit more exactly how it would have evolved. Yeah, I get it. The prominences you study, like you basically try to theoretically understand how they form or well where where they form. Once they form, can they actually then get back to the surface or can they only be ejected? Do you know anything about that? That's such a good question. So, yeah, there's been some recent research that suggests that where they form will determine whether they're going to be thrown outwards or whether they might fall back to the surface of of the star. So if they form kind of close enough to the star, then when the magnetic field kind of gets disrupted and the Mm -hmm. cloud can't be held in place anymore, then it'll fall back to the surface, which is often, not always, but often what we see on the sun. And if they form too far out, then that's just not possible. They'll just just be thrown out and there's no way for them to make it back to the surface. I guess it's kind of similar to if you think about having like a a spaceship in orbit around the Earth. You know, if, if you switch off your engines and you're close enough to the Earth, you'll fall back down. But yeah. otherwise, if you're too far away and your engines fail, you're in trouble. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I think people maybe didn't hear, hear so much about the prominences, but a lot of people might have heard about stellar winds. But are you also looking into that? Yeah, so the winds of stars are, I guess... In case anyone doesn't know what a wind is, I should briefly mention (laughs) stars have a magnetic field and certain places around the star, the magnetic field kind of looks like a loop. So it joins back to the surface and that helps keep all of the material attached to the star. And if your magnetic field line kind of goes off into space and it doesn't join back to the surface, then that doesn't happen. And so material starts to flow out throughout space and we call this a, a wind because it's a, a blowing of, of material. We do know that these are very important in determining how stars will kind of get older. Yeah, prominences and winds, we don't know exactly how prominences form, mm-hmm. but we do know that the material has to come from the surface of the star because that's where the stuff is. In some sense, they're very similar because the material has to get from the surface of the star upwards yeah. into into kind of the atmosphere. And the difference is that in a prominence, it can't escape and it gets stuck there, whereas in a wind, it, it does escape. So whilst we don't know exactly how they form, we do think that there's uh, kind of a lot of analogies um, between them. So it's because of that, it's quite interesting to compare how they yeah. can affect the star and how it gets older. I do spend a bit of time thinking about stellar winds as well. And I guess from a a career point of view, Mm -hmm. it's probably a good idea because (laughs) they're much more studied. And like you said, a lot more people will have heard of them because they're a it's a much bigger field, I guess, um, in in stellar physics. So yeah, very interesting things. Exactly. Maybe let's let's try to go a bit more into how you study them. Your work is theory work, and I guess still it has to relate in some sense to the observations. Yeah, maybe let's start with the theory first, and then we can go into how this actually can be checked and verified. So how, how do you approach the topic? How does it work? Yeah, so like you say, I'm definitely a theorist. I don't ever look down a telescope or have <laughs> any <laughs> any of my own data from a telescope either. I came from a very much a theoretical background. Um, the work that I do is 
is all on my computer and it's all kind of modeling, uh, a lot of coding, although I use that word very, I'm very careful about using that word because I'm not a very proficient coder, you know, so I don't want people to feel like you have to be an amazing coder to, to do this kind of thing because I'm not. So I don't, I don't want to give that impression, but low level yeah. computer coding. <laughs> Um, I guess my recent work, I have used some observational stuff. So I have some collaborators that um, observe particular stars and they can tell me what the magnetic field looks like on Mm -hmm. the surface of the star. So that's my connection, I guess, to the observational stuff. And I use that to say, well, okay, that's that's what my magnetic field looks like on the surface. But what does that look like everywhere else? Because my clouds, they're they're not at the surface of the star, they're above the surface. Yeah. And so I need to know what the magnetic field looks like there. So I use um, a, a simulation to calculate that. And then I can calculate it in which bits I will find a cloud. and. I guess at that point, that's when you start to kind of get some theoretical data that you can then compare to your Mm -hmm. observations. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I guess one of the interesting but difficult things to come out of my recent work is that I found all of the places around these stars that you could you could have a prominence. And a lot of them, if you looked at the geometry of the system, basically you would never be able to see them because we only see clouds if they we need them to pass kind of in front of the star and then they block out some light yeah yeah you cannot verify basically all of the sides because the star is dynamically rotating and it all moves in space so you only catch one in i don't know a hundred or even more yeah probably exactly this is, is extremely fascinating but it's also because it, it cannot be verified quickly it's it's also so difficult i mean frustrating <laughs> would you like to have a more clear answer more quickly or i think for me it's not it's not so much the inability to verify it quickly it's just that i guess what i find frustrating is that if you then take kind of all the mathematical models and you look at how the prominences would affect the star, Mm -hmm. it suggests that they would affect the star a lot because there's a lot of prominences. But if you look at the observations, you don't see very many of them. And so up until now, it was kind of, well, we thought that maybe they weren't that important. And so I guess I'm frustrated in the sense that I want to know now, well, do they affect the star or not? (laughs) (laughs) This I got, yeah, I can understand that. Well, I am very fascinated by your work, but I'm also fascinated by how actually you came to study this. So you are currently at University of St. Andrews, right? In in Scotland. Yeah. And you said yourself that before doing your PhD as astrophysicist, you actually didn't really study astrophysics. You studied physics. So was it difficult to transition to to focus on astrophysics without like doing an undergrad in in that direction maybe you can tell us a bit more about this decision sure yeah um yeah I like being asked this question because I think it's it's very easy for people to feel like once they've picked their undergrad that they're Mm -hmm. completely narrowed into a subject and I really I really feel like from my experience personally and other people that I know that that's not the case. So I like (laughs) to reinforce that uh, whenever I can. I did uh, physics, my undergrad specifically, I guess I did theoretical physics. So I definitely came from a more kind of physics-y background. I did do a a couple of vaguely related courses Mm -hmm. in my undergrad to astro. So I had a little bit of exposure to it, but I I wasn't, you know, I definitely wasn't an astrophysicist. And I always felt like, oh, I'll never be able to get into the PhD I want to do now (laughs) yeah, um, because I haven't done astrophysics. And a lot of other people that I went to university with did do astrophysics. So I thought that this was very much the route you had to take. 
But it turns out lots of people don't do that. <laughs> lots of people do physics or something else, maths or, you know, even engineering sometimes and ending up on that route. There are two things that make it, I guess, challenging. First of all, there's then like the, I don't want to call it like imposter syndrome because I guess you are different to other people in a sense. Yeah. Um, but there's that feeling of like, I don't belong here. I don't fit in because I haven't done it the right way, even though there is no right way. So that's kind of the challenging thing, I think, is overcoming that. It's not so much. It's not external. Anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I had to pick up some stuff, I guess, some knowledge that I didn't have. But equally, I had more maths background than other people. So mm -hmm. everyone just has different skills. I don't feel that I'm suffering in my PhD because I don't know about galaxies, which I would have learned about if I'd done astrophysics. Sure. So you're saying that like you always had an interest in physics or as a kid, did you actually like something else? Did you like the astronomy also before or was it more something you picked up during studies and it just seemed very interesting? Yeah, I guess... Um... I guess I loved space in the same way that all kids love space. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's cool. Uh, you can't, you can't not love it, I think. But I guess I wasn't any more keen on it than, than your typical kid. I always liked science in general. And I, for a long time, wanted to um, be a vet. I don't, I don't know. I loved learning all about different animals and uh, the biological processes, I guess. And then I realized that being a vet is actually just like giving medicine to animals or doing surgeries. There's not, once you've stopped studying, there yeah. isn't really any science, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I get it. Uh, I grew out of that one relatively quickly, I guess. <laughs> um, then I found kind of a love for, for chemistry at that point. And then I realized the chemistry that I liked was actually physics, <laughs> but I didn't have the words to describe that. I guess I must have been in the middle of high school at this point. Yeah, I guess that was where my love of physics came from. And at that point, that was what I wanted to do as my undergrad with the, the regular worry that maybe I didn't want to do that because everyone else in my class was a guy <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're exactly so. I wanted to touch on that uh, we've had actually a girl physicist here before she is working on quantum physics and she also mentioned that while she was studying in Russia most of her class were guys and she actually encountered quite a lot of comments about not belonging there like mm -hmm. like it wasn't really a place for her so I was wondering your experience in Scotland and yeah throughout your education how was it were there any comments and were there any situations in which you felt like as a girl you don't really belong I think um so I definitely felt it in high school I think there were maybe three or four of us in my uh I guess I don't know what the equivalent is, but the kind of like the first set of exams that you do mm -hmm. in high school mm -hmm. in Scotland, we then do these things called hires, um, which are basically the exams you need to get into university. By the point I got to my hires, there was then only, I think, three of us. And by advanced hire, there was wow. then, I think, two of us. So slowly getting picked off more and more. And yeah, I felt it then. I felt like I stuck out. As, as the odd one out you know what I mean I think yes <laughs> um so yeah and then because I kind of felt like I had this experience at high school I was very careful about where I went to do my undergrad mm -hmm. and I specifically chose to go to St Andrews for my undergrad because when I got there there were a lot of women doing physics that I saw about the building and I asked one of the people at the open day, um, you know, what, what was the gender balance uh, for, for their undergrads? And I can't remember what numbers they gave me, but it was pretty balanced, really, um, for, for physics. I think it was like 40% female wow. or something, which is a lot more, <laughs> more than a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that sold it to me, really. And that was why I pretty much why I went where I did. Yeah, so I think that helped my experience. 
but that doesn't mean that I haven't experienced uh, these kind of sexist things. Um, I think everyone <laughs> sadly still still does. You're always much more likely when you're in a lab group that if you're the female uh, identifying person, then you will be the one that ends up taking notes and all this kind of, you know, <sighs> yeah, it's still there. Um, so it's not perfect for sure. I guess it kind of came back again a bit more intensely by the end of my undergrad because at this point I was doing theoretical physics. And I guess the other person that you were speaking to in quantum physics has selected an area of physics which is notoriously uh, male dominated. So I felt this in, in my quantum classes that there were fewer of us and there were also fewer female lecturers in this area of physics and things like that. Yeah, it was another driver towards me doing astro because in my department and in a few conferences I've been to was a slightly better gender balance in in the areas of astro that I was interested in. I guess it becomes the eternal problem that if you have uh, if you have a field of research and there's a, a critical number of underrepresented groups, then you'll attract more of them. And if you don't have enough of them, then people won't want to to join that field because they see how big the divide is. Yeah, it, it's hard to be, you know, in an environment that is not at least starting to to change. You know, it feels better mm -hmm. if if the change is already beginning there. You are working actually currently with a supervisor that is a female astrophysicist professor, right? Was this also something that was important for you when you were looking for your for your supervisor? I guess I never set out to find a female supervisor. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a, a requirement in my in my choice. But it definitely there are subconscious things that go on there for, for lots of of reasons. So I, I knew when I started my PhD that I wanted to have a kid during my PhD because I would like to stay in academia and I felt that it would be difficult in my first postdoc or mm -hmm. second postdoc to have a kid and it would be easier to do that um, during my PhD. So that partly played into my decision because, well, I knew her and I knew that she had children. So I felt that it would be a supportive environment for me to make that choice. Not to say that, you know, um, I couldn't have had a male supervisor, but I think, I guess there are certain problems that you will experience that you might be more willing to share <laughs> with your yeah. supervisor if they have been through a more similar experience, I suppose. I can understand that. So I hope you don't mind me asking a bit in, about, like, yeah, the personal life, but... I guess having a kid during your studies might have sparked additional wave of, you know, uh, I want to say judgment, but also just like people reacting in different way because you are a female and now you have a kid. And did, did this really happen? Yeah, I guess um, it just so happened that around about the same time, um, a couple of other people in the astronomy department that were PhD students also had children. I see. So there were, <laughs> by <laughs> coincidence, which as you can imagine, created a lot of jokes. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> always us. like this. It's always like this. <laughs> so that, I guess, helped because I, I wasn't the PhD student who had a child. I did notice, so I guess uh, my my partner is also a PhD student, but Uh, in chemistry mm -hmm. uh, at the same university and when uh, we had our kid it was uh, summertime and I took uh, a month's parental leave and then I opted to go back to work but to work from home oh yeah Ooh. so yeah this is a challenge but because it was summer um it kind of worked out okay because I didn't have any teaching responsibilities and things like this my My husband took the the remaining maybe nine months, ten months, I'm not sure. I see. Um, and this was a very interesting experience because uh, 
seeing the reactions of the department to both of us was uh, interesting. You know, he was hailed as such a modern um, parent and isn't that amazing, etc. And I raised eyebrows coming back to work a month after having a kid as if that was not possible, despite the fact that men often only get two weeks leave. <laughs> you know, I know that maybe physically I have maybe done a, a bit more, but um, I had a very easy pregnancy and a very easy birth. You know, I didn't physically need um, any more time off. Obviously, it would have been nice if I could also had had more time of off, course. but that's just not how life works, right? So, um, yeah, it was very interesting. And, you know, even people who were very supportive of me, there was still a subconscious thing going on, which I found very interesting to to interact with. I think because we'd made this decision between the two of us quite early on and we were very happy with the decision, I didn't kind of upset me but it was very interesting watching people I I kind of feel like sometimes new mothers can't do right for doing wrong no matter what decision you make it's the wrong one for someone <laughs> you will be judged that you don't spend enough time with your kid that you do things a different way you know I, I mean honestly sometimes I feel like there is no right way anymore If you decide to have your kid later, you're judged for having the kid mm -hmm. late. If you do it early, you're judged that you somehow, yeah, do it like during your studies and this affects your studies and there is no right way. But I'm glad it worked out for you so well and that you can, you know, you could count on your partner. And then, I mean, it must have been hard to, you know, working as a theory person, especially, I guess, during pandemics because I guess you worked from home, to handle everything, it's quite impressive, I must say. Because I guess you need your focus, right? To really do the quantifications and to go through the maths. And then it's hard to to join the two words. So did you had to come up with some sort of a new system to do your work? Yeah, I uh, I think... Everyone has struggled in the pandemic um, with working. Everyone has had pro probably multiple issues <laughs> to deal with. Um, I don't really have anything to complain about in the sense that it's been very difficult for everyone. It's definitely been a challenge working from home with a, a toddler <laughs> um, and, and everything. I mean, I'm lucky that because I'm a theorist, I can in theory pun not intended do all of my work <laughs> from home and I don't have to go into a lab um, which is a lot of stress for a lot of people right now it has made things more difficult and I have gone half time for now just to kind of try and give myself a bit more time to get things done but at the same time you know it's, it's lovely to have an excuse to be <laughs> with them yeah. rather yeah. than I get it I've seen a lot of a lot of developments that they've had growing up that I would probably have missed otherwise because I would have been at work and you know probably granny would have been looking yeah. after them you know I'm really grateful for that even though it's been very difficult I guess you have to try and see the positives where you can right so that's a big positive for me <laughs> that's a great attitude I love it So you mentioned that you are also engaged in teaching as part of your PhD. And from what I actually, yeah, I saw on your website and I was reading, it seems like you really enjoy this part of, of the PhD and also just engaging in, in outreach activities. And it seems like it's, it's an important part of, of who you are. I wanted to ask two things. One is, how do you find... Yeah, like being a teaching assistant uh, during university courses and like, do, do, do you enjoy it and do you, do you like the, that opportunity? And yeah, then I would like to go a bit more into more of a public outreach um, ideas that you have. But let's start with the university. So I haven't done any teaching this year during the pandemic because I felt it I felt it was a bit too much for me with everything else going on. I was kind of 
a bit sad to, <laughs> to, to give it up. Um, I definitely always enjoyed interacting with the undergrads. They always come up with such interesting solutions <laughs> to the homework. They always have so many great questions. And, you know, my favorite ones are the ones where they ask a question and you think, I have absolutely no idea <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at all. <laughs> And I just, I just love all of that, but not everyone does. Right. And so at my university, it's, it's not compulsory to teach. Um, I like that because I think people who want to do it should do it. And people that don't want to do it shouldn't be forced to do it. It's not good for anyone if someone's having to do something that they really don't oh, want to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I agreed 100%. In my, it's my institute. It's, we have to do it for one semester. Uh, be a TA in a course, like um, just help with it. But then if you want to do more, you can. You can even teach courses, like small courses by yourself. But if you don't feel like you like doing it, then you don't have to. And I think this is much, much better because there are people who really have this, you know, this spark and they can really, yeah, like just convey their love and their interests so well. And then you have someone who comes and they just do it because they have to. And, and it clearly can be reflected. And if you think about the influence that your course might have on somebody else's decisions. Yeah, I think this is better if it's done this way. So what about your public outreach activities? So on Instagram, your account is pretty big, I must say. And I really love it. For the people out there who want to find you, your nickname is Astrophysicist Rose. Yeah, I actually found your account a while back. And I loved the, when you started this graphic series where you explain some physics term with your own, your own drawings. It's kind of like a dictionary thing, right? I think it's really cool. And I was wondering, where did the idea come from? Why did you want to start doing this? So I guess um, I've always felt that outreach is very important um, for lots of reasons that I I won't go into because I feel like you could make an entire podcast out of that alone. Um, but basically, I think it's important that scientists communicate what they do to the public. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that way, but I'm not an outgoing person. And I find things like public speaking, you know, incredibly difficult and not enjoyable and they become a chore. So I guess I was looking for a place for me to do some sort of outreach, as limited as it, it might be, in a way that didn't terrify me. <laughs> um, so uh, I started an Instagram account quite a while ago. And initially it was just kind of talking a bit about what I did, I mm -hmm. guess, with my life as a, as a PhD student in astrophysics. And it kind of developed quite a lot, really, um, over the time. And I guess the cartoon aspect came from, so because I'm a theorist, I often am trying to visualize what I'm doing with some maths or with a bit of code. And the easiest way to do that is to draw a picture, right? So yeah. I'm often drawing pictures for myself. And I kind of realized this was a way to make things accessible to people, right? Like Definitely. People see a picture and I guess the saying of a picture paints a thousand words. It, it helps people understand. That's exactly why I was doing it for myself. I kind of then thought, oh, I could maybe make something out of this. Maybe I could share some on, on Instagram and stuff like that. Um, and over time, it's kind of developed itself. So I guess you're talking about the A to Z series that I've been yeah, doing recently. Yeah, I love it. I really love it. I have a brother who is 10 year old. And, you know, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing him soon, hopefully, and showing this because he loves physics. For him, physics is the coolest thing, even though he still doesn't have classes in physics. But he is so good at, at finding some information on YouTube, even though he's still quite small, watching a similar way videos, like cartoon videos. And then he explains to me stuff, you know, how electricity works or like how gravity works and I'm just so impressed because 
this kind of medium really, the way that you do it, I can see that being easily translatable to adults, but also to like really smaller kids who can really get the idea relatively quickly. So yeah. Kids are so bright. Yeah, I know. Like, they pick things up so quickly. And I just, I'm so, I wish I could do that. Like, I see kids and you kind of, like, explain something to them. You think, oh, maybe that was a bit complicated. And they go, oh, I see. And they explain it back to you. And exactly. You think, I wish I had understood that that quickly. <laughs> I, I guess it's something about not feeling like there's a lot of limitations to to the word. Taking everything and observing and just... Having much less, I don't know, like borders in your head that, that limit your way of, of thinking about stuff. It's, it's just amazing. In your future, do you see yourself doing much more of this? Like working with education and the outreach? I know that you are now working on some courses for high school students, right? So um, I have been working with a company uh, called Space Science LLC, um, which is a, a new uh, startup. And they are creating some um, various types of astro courses for high school students. Um, that is going to be launched in the US to try and introduce high school kids to some kind of astro-related uh, um ideas uh various things you know from like engineering side of things all the way to like biology side of things right yeah I've been working with them and uh really enjoying it I guess it's kind of the next step from kind of doing cartoons that go onto Instagram to kind of targeting a bit more I just love everything that they're you know that they're doing as well I think it's really fantastic so it's nice to feel like I'm putting my time into something that's gonna make some sort of a difference you know um I've been enjoying that and I it has got me thinking well what am I gonna do next the event horizon of the end of my PhD is up and coming (laughs) with every passing day I'm starting to feel oh no I'm gonna have to get a job (laughs) um yeah I'm not I'm not really sure exactly what I want to do but I definitely feel education related things are incredibly important I, I love sharing science, uh, particularly astro, but, you know, science in general um, with people. And I would love to do some more research as well, but we all know that, well, all of us in academia know that uh, postdoc positions can be quite a, yeah. quite a competition um, and things. So uh, I guess I don't want to have my heart broken. <laughs> But you are considering a postdoc as a possibility. Yeah, I would love to do one um, at least just to kind of, because I did my master's project in the same department that I did my, uh, uh, my I'm doing my PhD with, um, I guess. To clarify, I did uh, what you can do in Scotland as an integrated master's. So mm-hmm. you do your, your BSc and your master's all in one um, I see. which makes it a lot cheaper so a lot of people choose <laughs> to do that all of the research that I've done has been in one place and I've loved it but I guess I would like to work with you know, someone else uh, at least once just to see sure. what it's like there are always the added complications of I was going to say the two body problem but I guess now with the exactly. child the three body three problem, body problem. <laughs> I I completely understand that my husband is also in science and it's it's always mm-hmm. yeah it's tricky. Okay, so we talked about your work, we talked about the public outrage. What I also like to ask my guests um is what do they like to do outside of science? And I know that the Instagram kind of falls into that, but I'm sure you have some some other things that you like to do. So, yeah, yeah. What, what is it? What can you share with us? I am a keen fair weather runner. <laughs> 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 I, I do enjoy running uh, or I enjoy having been for a run. I don't really enjoy the running bit, <laughs> um, but I only enjoy that when the weather is 
vaguely acceptable. So I haven't for a couple of weeks been doing that. Uh, it's been too hot for me. I don't like running when it's too hot. Mm -hmm. Um, I enjoy reading when I have time for it. I guess Terry Pratchett would be a a novelist that would be very high up my list. I love him. Constantly go back to him in periods of strife like the pandemic. Uh, I find his writing very comforting. So yeah, uh, I would rank that highly. I I love him as well. The intelligent humor, you know, just like all the grotesque play on the word around us. It actually makes you feel a bit lighter. I can get it. I can get it. Definitely. (laughs) Yeah, I guess that would be uh, another uh, hobby of mine. Uh, Right now, most of my spare time goes into being with um, my toddler who keeps me very busy. And I also have a puppy as well. So (laughs) that combination is entertaining. (laughs) Yeah. So... Yeah, this um, is already quite preoccupying. Uh, we talked about cool stuff and cool science. What I also like to ask my guests, and I think this is something that that really is important to realize, are the things that don't work out in science very well and don't work out in academia very well. So I call this part a room for improvement. And I'm always very interested what my guests find to be particularly timely or particularly lacking either in their surroundings or you know just in general in the in the scientific world in the in the academia we mentioned a bit about the gender representation in in science and i guess in physics this is this is especially uh, true but um so we can either talk about that a bit more or maybe there's something else that you have in mind that you would like to touch upon I mean, I guess there are always, there are issues uh, in all lines of work. I think in general, and I guess it also encompasses kind of the gender situation, the thing that I find challenging about academia, not that everywhere else is is perfect, but is that it can be quite inaccessible to people, whether that's, you know, uh, feeling underrepresented so feeling like physics isn't for them because they're female or you know whether it's more I don't know tangible if that's the right word Mm -hmm. lab spaces often are not very accessible if you have um you know if you're in a wheelchair for example often you are locked out of doing PhDs or, or research in in places because you can't get into the lab and there are accessibility issues everywhere yeah um I find this a challenge I I sat on um the equality diversity and inclusion committee in my school for quite a few years and not that I don't think that my school was particularly uh resistive to change but one thing that I have found in general in academia is that people can be very, very set in their ways and there can be resistance to doing things a different way. An example that is not, to some people, a big deal is at my school, uh, in my department, there has in the past been a lot of resistance to putting lecture notes online for people or recording their lectures uh, and having them online. And now we've been in a pandemic and they've been forced to do this because people cannot physically come into the building. And, you know, this is very common in a lot of departments. It's not specific to mine. I know it from Poland as well. And I find myself rolling my eyes, you know, oh, think of all the time you could have saved if you'd already done this before because there was a demand for it. And it's not such a big thing. It's no. really like, it's not like you have to change the entire infrastructure or you know exactly. you have to get more money for it. It's just a tiny tweak uh, that yeah. could have <laughs> Yeah. And it's it's so frustrating because if you are uh, an able-bodied person, it's still helpful to have the lecture notes online. Of course. So it doesn't you know, hurt anyone. It, it can exactly. just help. Yeah. 
but it discriminates against people who, you know, have any form of disability that means that they struggle to write the notes down quickly enough or have any form of anything that means that they might not be able to turn up to lectures all the time. Exactly. They're being penalized because you don't want to put your notes in and recordings online, etc. Uh, and that's just like a drop in the ocean. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, that's like an easy thing to do that people resist doing. I find the accessibility issues uh, very frustrating. Yeah, there is this attitude of, you know, saying, but this is how things have always been. And it was great. So why would we change that? And I think this is an ongoing discussion in so many places around. I had similar thoughts when I was in my undergrad in Poland, in Warsaw. Yeah, I I was very frustrated with this, I must say. Like, you know, the you want to change some small stuff and you just hit a wall that is not even... It doesn't even make sense. Like, if yeah. if you think about it, I'm actually very happy in Austria. I feel like here it's it's different. And I don't know whether this is because the institute I'm working in is also relatively young and it's kind of trying to embody a lot of, yeah, more inclusive values. And, and you can see that. I mean, of course, every place has its, yeah, downfalls. But I actually feel like at least... There is an openness to change and like to to suggestions, but I feel like at universities it's harder because they've been there for a longer time, and you get relatively low influx of young professors because mm-hmm. when you become the professor at the university, I don't know if it's like this in Scotland as well, but like you can be the professor forever. There's not such a high chance for young people to become professors with a permanent position because these places are occupied. Yeah, it leads to issues, I think. Uh, you know, it's if you want uh, to have a workforce that is more uh, inclusive, you know, it's uh, more gender balanced, it's more inclusive of LGBT uh, people, it has more racial balance. Yeah. It's, it's less ableist, then you got to do the work. It doesn't come from nowhere. <laughs> you have to you have to make it accessible to people. And it's frustrating when uh, you come up against that brick wall and you think, why is this wall here? This doesn't make any sense. It's exactly. not. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it will only help people. <laughs> I agree. Okay, so I guess we are coming towards the end. Two of the last questions that I like to ask, and I think this would be a cool to hear from you about... If you would have a gigantic amount of money or you had like um, all the opportunities that exist in the world, what is the experiment or the kind of work that you would like to do? Yeah, if all the doors were open and there were no real world limitations, what would you like to do? Is this uh, out of anything or is this specific to my research? (laughs) No, it can be it can be anything. I'm actually curious what is close to your heart. I guess right now it's very difficult to think of much apart from the pandemic. <laughs> it's been going on for so long and yeah. causing issues for so many people in in so many ways. Um, I'm sure some of which I can't even comprehend. Someone at the university in the department that I work in, uh, he's he's an astrophysicist by training, but he also works on a lot of uh, medical physics because okay. he, I mean, I don't know how much you know about Monte Carlo techniques. I don't know very much about it, <laughs> but it's some sort of amazing coding thing that he once tried to teach me in a course and I okay. had to give up because it was so over my head. He's been doing some research into um, using UV radiation, like low level to and its effectiveness, I guess, at killing, well, not just COVID, I guess any virus in kind of just like in rooms. So like you would be in a lecture theatre yeah. and there would be, you know, these lights in the room and they would, people wouldn't need to wear a mask. People wouldn't have to sit particularly far apart. I guess the theory, not that I have read that many of his recent papers, yeah. but I guess the theory is that the UV radiation does the damage to the virus before it can infect anyone uh, before there's enough of it built up to infect anyone you have to obviously have you have to be careful about 
the energy of your UV radiation because you don't want to make yeah. anyone in the room ill yeah. um, or cause them any skin damage and stuff. But I guess I would like to to put some more funding into that because there would, to just bring back a bit of normality. Yeah, because I feel there's the vaccine programs are fantastic, um, but obviously, as with all things, it's you're in a significantly better place if you're in certain countries than in other countries. Oh. Uh, and some some countries, uh, not that I have strong feelings on my own or anything, but some countries have spent a lot of money buying a lot of vaccines that other countries also needed um yeah I think it you know I think it's just it would allow people to have some sense of normality even if they haven't been vaccinated yeah I can understand it just you know to it's a relatively I mean it would be a relatively easy fix requiring way less money just to put into play and yeah obviously you know, I, I don't know exactly how the how long you can sit in these environments, but that's I guess what an unlimited amount of funding and research could find to out. Study, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> allow agreed. us to to know, I don't know, to to make this perhaps feasible in some way, even if it is for a limited amount of, of use that you could individually have from it. So yeah. It's not astrophysics. I but, love it still. I feel like it speaks very highly to to what you find important, and it's good. I think this is no. this is nice. I love it. Uh, okay, so one last question. I like to ask my guests about their let's call it idols or inspirations. So if you could have a coffee or tea or dinner with someone that you admire or someone that you've always wanted to talk to, either someone who is uh, currently living or someone that has already passed away, who would that be? Oh. Yeah. Oh, so much choice. <laughs> the, ent- the entirety of human history to choose from. Yeah, uh, that's I what don't... makes it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wouldn't want it to be someone from the, the past that I look up to too much because I I wouldn't want my feelings on them to be... I wouldn't want to be disappointed. Uh, So I guess someone that I would like to have a coffee with is uh, Jim Mm Al-Khalili, who's potentially someone that that your listeners might know of, in case you haven't. He's a theoretical physicist. Uh, I think he's still at the University of Surrey, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. And he does a lot of outreach. He has done, he's written books, he's done lots of radio plays he's done a lot of tv shows been to a lot of science festivals when I was quite young I think I must have been about 13 I went to uh, the science festival in Edinburgh and he was at one of the events that I went to I I dragged my mom all the way down to Edinburgh she so kindly came to all of the physics stuff that I dragged her to even though she didn't like physics at school she hated it I think probably for a lot of the gender issues that we've mentioned yeah. although she perhaps couldn't name it as that I think that's probably what a lot of the the problems were and she so so caringly sat with me through all of these talks about string theory and oh quantum mechanics and stuff she just kind of sat there like I have no idea what is going on <laughs> and he was at one of them he was presenting one of them and I loved it it was amazing and afterwards I went up to him and said oh can I have your autograph and he's like yeah of course oh my and god he was so like he was so shocked um I think because he was also on the panel with uh with Brian Cox who at the time was a lot more famous and he's kind of saying to me don't you want to get Brian's autograph no I, I want your autograph I, oh my god no, I, want, so I want your autograph and he was so cute he was so lovely and he's probably one of the reasons why I ended up doing theoretical physics why I I stuck to I it, it where I, why I am where I am right and I would just love to meet him and have coffee and, and say you know you don't remember I'm sure because it's not a big deal to you but as a 13 year old it was a massive thing 
This is amazing. I, I bet he would love it. Like, you know, it's just... I mean, these people do it because... Like, also you do it because you want to make a change. Like, even if it's very small change. And, and imagine meeting someone in a few years that actually looked at your cartoons or your materials and also became a physicist. This is, like, such a powerful feeling. I love it. If I can do that for one person, then my job is done, right? Exactly. I mean. This is important. So. It's important. Well, I hope you get the chance to to meet him. You know, who knows? Yeah, we'll see. I'll tweet him with a link to your to your podcast. Exactly. Hey Jim, do you want to meet for coffee? <laughs> he should he should definitely do that. I'm very happy we had the chance to talk. Honestly, it's been most inspiring. I feel like your love for science is really contagious and I just love it. I really love it and I Wish you all the best, both with your work and, you know, defending the theses and and dealing with all that. But also, whatever you decide to do for the future, I'm sure it will be, it will be great. And I hope you can still do what you love most. And thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the final edited version without all of my internet issues. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and also I'm looking forward to hearing all the all the other ones you know all, all the other all episodes because it's it's just so refreshing you know hearing people talking about their experiences in science like for me it's it, it's amazing I get to meet people and you know I get to hear their stories but I also find it super cool when people reach out and they say you know this resonated with me so well I also was in this spot and it also happened to me and it just feels yeah like you can reach people and and it's just so cool and you know, science is also super cool. And I feel like due to the pandemics, we don't interact maybe as much as we would in normal uh, situations. So I'm glad I get to do this and I'm glad you are my guest. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. And I hope we stay in touch. Thanks. <laughs>